Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. And today's topics are Condorcet's paradox and social preference functions. We've talked at length about completeness and transitivity. From the last lecture, we know that those two things together imply rationality, and it makes perfect sense for an individual's preferences to be rational. What we're going to see in this lecture is that the same does not apply for group preferences. Group preferences can easily be irrational because they violate transitivity. Let's see a simple example to illustrate this. And to keep things as compact as possible, let's consider a case with just three people and three different outcomes. It might help to name these people to keep track of everything. So I don't know, how about three random names like Donald, Marco, and Ted? Donald, Marco, and Ted have a lot of disagreements, and today they're disagreeing over where to go for dinner. There's Armenian food, there's Brazilian food, and there's Chinese food. And each one of these guys has a different preference for what they have for dinner. Donald, for example, he loves China. Loves China. China's the best. And so his most preferred outcome is to get Chinese food, then Armenian food, then Brazilian food. Marco does not love China as much as the Donald does, so his most preferred outcome is to have Armenian food, then Brazilian food, and then Chinese food. Lastly, Ted on the end most likes Brazilian food, then Chinese food, and then Armenian food. I want to take a time out here and note that each one of these individuals has a linear ordering. So Donald's preferences are complete and transitive, Marco's preferences complete and transitive, and Ted's preferences, you get it, it's complete and transitive. All three of these individuals are rational. Donald is a rational human being, Marco is a rational human being, and Ted is a rational human being. Comments below notwithstanding. Happy 2016, everyone. But just because we have individuals with rational preferences doesn't mean that the group preference is going to be rational as well. But in order to even get to group preference, we have to talk about what that means. So, in fact, a group preference is defined by a social preference function. A social preference function takes individual preferences as inputs and then outputs a preference ordering based on those preferences. So you can imagine this as an algorithm that looks at a situation like this, where Donald prefers C to A to B, Marco prefers A to B to C, and Ted prefers B to C to A. And this algorithm is going to take a look at each of these preferences, and then it's going to give us a group preference, a preference that speaks for all three of them based off of the information that it is taking in. And again, we call that a social preference function. It might help to see one of these social preference functions in action. And in fact, in order to demonstrate that these social preference functions can come up with intransitive preferences, we actually need to do an example. Fortunately, the most common way of aggregating preferences in this manner also produces the intransitivity. So let's think about majority rule. This is the most common way that democracies aggregate social preferences, so it's in fact a very wise place to start. Majority rule says that if more individuals prefer x to y than y to x, then the group prefers x to y. If the same number of people prefer x to y as y to x, then the group is indifferent. That's what majority rule does. And so the social preference function of majority rule is going to look at the preferences of Donald, Marco, and Ted, and then use this algorithm to spit out a group preference. So let's go ahead and do this together. The majority rule is going to be looking at these pairwise comparisons, two different outcomes at a time. So let's start by looking at A versus B, Armenian food versus Brazilian food. Notice here that I've grayed out Chinese food because Chinese food does not matter for the pairwise comparison between Armenian food and Brazilian food. So we see here that Donald prefers A to B and Marco also prefers A to B. Ted is alone with his preference for B to A. So Ted is in the minority, Donald and Marco are in the majority. The majority rule says that Donald and Marco win, so the group preference is A to B, Armenian food to Brazilian food. And we can draw that using these arrows just as we would have done before, and that's what we have here. A is preferred to B by the group. Now let's do this for B versus C. So I have grayed out the A's because A doesn't matter for the pairwise comparison between C and B. And what do we see here? Well, China, Donald loves China, 
he likes his China, and so he likes his Chinese food over his Brazilian food, but Donald is in the minority here. We have Marco and Ted, both who prefer B to C, and so Marco and Ted have the majority. Donald is in the minority, and majority rule says, therefore, that Marco and Ted's preference wins. So the group preference for B to C is, in fact, B is preferred to C arrow on your screen there, just like it has been before for this group preference. That leaves us with one pair left. We have A versus C. So now let's gray out B and take a look at what we have here. Well, once again, we have Donald loving China. So Chinese food is preferred to Armenian food for him. And that's also true for Ted on the end. He likes C to A. It's only Marco who prefers A to C, which means Marco is in the minority here. Donald and Ted are in the majority, and so the group prefers Chinese food to Armenian food, and Donald is very happy about that. So we have on the arrow right here, C to A, just like that. So now we've had three slides with these arrows. Let's see what happens when we combine them together. Uh-oh. Do you see that problem? Notice that we have A is preferred to B by the group, the group prefers B to C, and the group prefers C to A, and that is a preference cycle, which means this is not a transitive preference. So we started with individuals with transitive preferences, and we've come up with a preference ordering using the majority rule, a perfectly plausible way to aggregate social preferences and yet, as it turns out, this makes the world explode because we have an intransitive group preference. There is no single outcome here that the group prefers to any other outcome. Because if we're looking at A, well, yeah, A is preferred to B, but C is preferred to A. Meanwhile, B is preferred to C, and B can't be the best because A is preferred to B. We're in that preference cycle that we've seen before, which means that we don't really have a top-ranked outcome. So if we were to try to assign expected utilities to this individual, we couldn't come up with a numerical ordering for this because we have this cyclical preference as we've seen before. This is a big problem. We've actually known about this problem for a really long time. It was first discovered by Marquis de Condorcet in the 18th century. He was the first person to look at these individually rational preferences and notice that collectively, when you aggregate them using majority rule, you can run into these intransitivities. Now, you might wonder if we have a social preference rule like majority rule that leads to these weird intransitivities, why don't we just use something else? After all, there are infinitely many social preference functions out there, and so if this one does things that we don't like, why don't we just use something else? Well, it took a couple hundred years, but eventually we got our answer. There is no easy solution to this problem. Kenneth Arrow, in a paper published in 1951, showed that no social preference function fixes this problem with intransitivity without breaking something else. So if you want to have a social preference function that leads to transitive preferences, you're going to be sacrificing something else elsewhere. This is known as Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. It's really neat. You can read about it more on Wikipedia. It's a little bit out of the scope of this class on game theory, though. Nevertheless, what it's telling us is that there's really no winning with these social preference functions. The only winning to be had is by Ken Arrow himself, and I say that because my calendar reads 2016 as I'm filming this. He publishes this paper in 1951. 65 years have passed in between. Ken Arrow is still teaching classes, he still goes to talks, he still asks questions at talks. He is the greatest economist alive, and this Arrow's Impossibility Theorem won him a Nobel Prize, but he hasn't stopped. We could all strive to be this amazing and this productive 65 years after our seminal work. Now, that aside... What do we have learned here? What have we learned here? Well, our too long didn't watch is that rationality of individual preferences makes a lot of sense, but these rationality of group preferences does not. And there's been a lot of interesting work in both political science, well, political science, economics, and social choice theory that have all tried to figure out ways around this issue. And they're neat, but again, there's really no simple solution. And the important takeaway point is that if we're going to be thinking about group preferences, we might not be able to assign expected utilities to them in a sensible way. All right, I hope you enjoyed this. This was our last talk about rationality. And so you can join me next time when we advance to our next axiom for expected utility theory. See you then.